This is Twit. Let's get to some headlines, shall yes, we? Yes, yes. Busy week. So busy for, week. Yeah, and boy, oh boy, right down my alley from Reuters, Boeing sues Virgin Galactic. Yeah, really. Not on my bingo card list this <laughs> this week. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, but the, yeah, this, this actually happened. Uh, actually, the twenty second. So the news broke last late last week before our uh, our episode. Um, then, but yeah, Boeing is suing Virgin Galactic over um, a dispute revolving their plans for a new mothership uh, for their suborbital space plane uh, 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 fleet. You know, as you know, Virgin Galactic is kind of scaling up their new fleet, the Delta class of the Spaceship Two vehicles, which can uh, uh, you know be easier to fly, faster to turn around. And they want, because they're going to have more of these vehicles, another uh, mothership like the White Knight Two. Uh, right. a carrier plane that will be able to kind of go up, you know, get, get, get these craft to, to altitude, drop them, let them launch and, and whatnot. And white Knight two, just like the spaceship twos need maintenance. You know, there's there, the turnaround time isn't as fast as what Virgin Galactic wants. So they want this second uh, generation carrier plane to, to do all of that, be able to fly more often, uh, fly with, with, with less uh, maintenance and, and be more reliable. And to do that, they tapped Aurora flight sciences. That's a subsidiary of, of Boeing, as I understand it. Um, and they've been working uh, behind the scenes to kind of develop the plans for all of this. Well, apparently that relationship uh, soured dramatically uh, because at the end of, of, of the the contract or whatnot, uh, Boeing is saying that uh, uh, that Virgin Galactic owes uh, Aurora Flight Sciences something like twenty five million in unpaid fees for work done on this uh, design, uh, as well as uh, that Virgin Galactic uh, they allege that they they kept some trade secrets. And as I understand it, it's like some design type uh, expertise and some equations used for the vehicles themselves. Uh, some really kind of high tech stuff. Uh, and they're supposed to destroy all of that. And and uh, Aurora Flight Sciences is worried that, you know, if, since they haven't destroyed it, they can just take it and build their own mothership instead of working with Boeing and, and the company on that. Uh, or go to another company and say, hey, we got all this stuff here. Why don't you build it for us now? So uh, a very kind of uh, a convoluted yet uh, I think it's going to be a case to watch because depending on the outcome, we'll find out where or when they're going to get this other uh, carrier plane because a lot of their business plan will revolve on being able to launch uh, more of these uh, suborbital space planes uh, over and over again, and they need more carrier planes to do it, at least one more. So. Should be noted, I suppose, that White Knight has flown a number of times very successfully with uh, with no adverse effects. White Knight 2, because White Knight 1 was, of course, the one that was used to carry the smaller Spaceship 1, which right. is now in the Smithsonian. So White but, Knight 2 is the one that Virgin Galactic is using now currently. My, Eve, my, I think, my is the, the point is that they both worked. And, well, anyway, there's probably something untoward to say about Boeing there. But I will keep it to myself <laughs> because I'm a nice guy and I know you're sensitive to that. All right. Well, and those were built by scaled composites, you know, way back when. And Burt Rutan's uh, Yeah, but using Boeing group. secrets. So. Yeah, well, I guess so, apparently. Apparently. Uh, all right. Next up from uh, Florida today. That's a new yeah. one for us. The Delta IV Heavy. Now, the Delta IV Heavy is a, uh, what would you call it? A sort of uh, soulful lineage of the delta rocket but it really isn't it's like like the atlas um mm -hmm. ula years ago completely redesigned both the delta and the atlas but the delta four heavy is three deltas clustered together it's very cool watching it launch is very neat and we're waiting for what we think is the final launch of that vehicle right that's right. That's right. You know, uh, before the rise of the Falcon Heavy rocket, the Delta IV Heavy was the most powerful rocket in the U.S. operational arsenal uh, at that point in time. And now uh, it is time for the United Launch Alliance, which has been building these uh, rockets for the last, um, uh, uh, you know, like a like couple couple of decades or, or whatnot, to just kind of say goodbye uh, to the uh, the the Delta Four Heavy uh, Heavy Lift because they have their new Vulcan rocket, of course. Uh, but it's not just the end of the Delta Four. This is the last of the Delta rocket family, Rod. Mm. So this is you know they 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 retired the Delta Twos uh, a, a while back. They they had other other variants uh, as well. Um, and in its sixty four year history, this is the last one that will ever fly. So there's a lot of uh, 
uh, of kind of attention uh, for this mission. And of course, it's like the most impressive variant, the the, the triple core uh, first stage, the Delta IV Heavy. It, was, it is launching a spy satellite for the National Reconnaissance uh, Office. And unfortunately, when they tried to launch it uh, yesterday, as we're recording this, uh, they had a, a bit of a plumbing issue uh, on, on on the rocket, and they are not able to launch it uh, today. They had hoped to, do, mm. to to kind of launch it before you and I started recording today. Um, and so they're going to take their time. They say that they need to have, uh, it's an issue with a government-supplied pipeline <laughs> that, that, that feeds into the rocket, and uh, and they're going to wait and get some information from the, the, the government, I guess, supplier uh, to to decide when it's going to be safe to actually fly the rocket itself. Uh, but if you didn't know that the the last of its kind rocket uh, Delta IV Heavy was going to fly, now you do. And if it does launch over this weekend, we're hearing maybe April first uh, is is the next possible to attempt. Uh, that's this way you won't miss it. It's a crazy to watch because when it lifts off, all this fire and flame kind of crawls up the side of the, the yeah. triple boosters uh, looks for like a little it's in bit big trouble. Yeah. yeah. It looks, it looks like it's on fire when it's taking off and then it lifts off and it goes into space and it, it looks to me like a uh, princess Leia ship in um, the, the, in the, in the, in star Wars, uh, uh, a new hope. So uh, I forget the name of that ship, but anyway, it's that one. So that cruiser. So, uh, I'm having trouble picturing that, but okay. I, I guess the I one that she's that. on that Darth Vader. In yeah, that, no, I like, understand what ship you mean. I just don't see the <laughs> resemblance. I always look more like, well, I won't say what it looked like to me. Um, <laughs> oh, the other thing about the Delta heavy was, I believe besides being the most powerful for its time up until, well, up until SLS, I think. No, Falcon, no, no, heavy, Falcon heavy. Falcon yeah. Heavy. So up until Falcon heavy, it was also the most expensive launcher you could buy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it was something like 450 million. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. One engine weighs 14,876 pounds and is 17 feet tall, according to Florida Today. So pretty crazy stuff. Because newspapers love those kind of stats. All right. And let us uh, roll to the next and last one. We have an eclipse coming up. That's right. And we would like you to go to space.com for a number of reasons to learn all about it. But perhaps most importantly, Rod's semi-annual warning about... Be very careful when you buy your eclipse glasses because there's a lot of forgeries out there. Yeah, this one comes from our reviewer Alex uh, Cox and uh, uh, and the American Association, uh, the American Astronomical uh, um, uh, Association, because they want everyone to be aware that you know, despite the excitement of the solar eclipse, which again, to everyone, there's a total solar eclipse. It's going to go uh, from Mexico through uh, Maine and Canada on April 8th in the afternoon. So it's going to be uh, like really noticeable. Most of North America uh, will have some kind of an eclipse, partial or otherwise, uh, during that time. But for uh, everyone, you know, you can't stare directly at the sun. You need uh, solar eclipse glasses, but they have to be verified and safe to use. And unfortunately, as we saw in 2017, during the last great American uh, solar eclipse, there's um, a lot of fraud going out there where people will just stick this um, ISO certification, an international standard that, that tells you that the the filter on the glasses themselves is rated to filter out most of the sunlight. They're just putting that 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 on there, and the the filters themselves aren't. So we have a an article uh, by Alex that really kind of touches all of the advice and um, and checkpoints uh, from the the AAS uh, to like help you kind of check if your glasses are safe. So this is like a reminder if you've bought some glasses or you're waiting for them. One, one way to, to check is uh, put them on inside the house and look at like your brightest lights and you shouldn't really see anything. See you shouldn't anything. see, yeah. yeah, you shouldn't see pictures on the wall. You shouldn't see like the, 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 anything around your, your office, maybe the brightest spotlight, like in your house, you could, it could look dim, but you really shouldn't see much at all. If that checks out, you can go outside and start looking around again. You shouldn't see anything uh, through the, the, the glasses themselves, except, uh, you know, a dim, uh, dimmed light from from the sun itself. So if it passes that inside test first, and that's really important, uh, then you can go outside and, and check. But you want to be sure that they're safe before you go look at the sun and you don't want to suffer any kind of uh, eye or retina damage because uh, you can really injure yourself. And of course, another reminder, never use binoculars or telescopes oh, or no. anything uh, when, when observing the sun unless you have an approved 
uh, filter made, you know, or approved by the manufacturer himself. I actually bought a Celestron telescope with a Celestron filter uh, that I can put on top of it and some uh, Celestron solar binoculars that are have the filter built in uh, so we don't have to worry about it and we can observe the sun uh, safely. And I know that they're safe because I trust the Celestron brand. I've been using their telescopes for years. Uh, and, and that's kind of how I have the peace of mind for myself there. But this is like a reminder because we're going to talk about the eclipse, I think, in our next episode, um, that if you've, if you've ordered equipment, make sure that it's safe. Um, don't just take the, the certification that's printed on it for granted. If they're paper uh, uh, glasses, make sure you d just do a, a quick double check from these guidelines from the AAS. And and we'll talk more about this next week, but just very quickly, because some people may be thinking, oh, crud, I need to order those glasses I've been putting off. Yes, you can go on Amazon. Uh, the majority of the stuff there is a little sketchy. If that says approved by NASA, it ain't because yeah. NASA isn't in the business of approving sunglasses or sun eclipse viewing glasses. And most of the ones I saw said approved by NASA. So that's bad juju. What you want to look for is Celestron, if you can get them in time. Lund, L-U-N-D, is a manufacturer of both little cardboard glasses and ones that look like conventional sunglasses and solar binoculars, as Celestron also makes. And I'm told, I think it's Astronomy Magazine, it might be Sky and Telescope, but I think it's Astronomy Magazine, if you can find that on the news rack, they have shrink wrap glasses with the magazine this month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an expensive way to get your solar glasses. But well, people, you a lot of a lot of libraries, schools, uh, uh, public public, they're 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 having well, giveaways. But another trusted company is American Paper Optics. They're the primary mm -hmm. supplier. Okay, in uh in in the U.S. and uh for, for these, so a lot of these companies, uh, Astronomy Magazine, etc., they're getting them. Uh, through special order because they make yeah. branded ones. They made them for space.com uh, uh, when we had ours uh, way back when. So but I, I think it's important for, for parents, especially, Yes, you know, if you do get glasses from a library, check them out because those guys aren't necessarily in the business of knowing how to do solar astronomy. And yeah. I won't go into my whole song and dance, but my eyes were moderately damaged by doing solar astronomy as a kid with an inadequate filter. You don't want to have cataracts when you're 45. So be careful, be safe, be smart. And uh, last thing I'll say is if you've got kids, don't let them stare at the sun for a particularly long time. These things are meant to be used for 20, 30 seconds at a time, not 10 minutes. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there. <laughs>